previously on For Wild's Sake. About the late 80s, someone discovered that smelt had been introduced. We knew it was going to be a huge project to try to pull off. In 2010, the pond was reclaimed. We brought them from the brink of extirpation back to a really viable population in there. So it's a success story. Now let's look at not losing anymore. Let's start there. Let's all agree we're not going to lose anymore. Please listen carefully. By the time we finally embarked on our migration out west, it was late November, and things were cooling off. The thing about old vehicles is, they tend to function best in a Goldilocks temperature range. Too hot, and they'll likely fry themselves, and too cold, well, let's just say they require a little more motivation to work properly. And that's just the mechanical side of our operation, let alone the predominantly water-based bodies we've crammed into this mobile ice box. Most vehicle dwellers with a propensity for winter activities install robust auxiliary heating solutions, but being as green as we were, we hadn't quite figured that part out yet. Oh, I forgot to mention, we have a cat with us too. Meet Levi, AKA the Prince of Kittens. AKA the Prince. AKA the Pupa. AKA, AKA, the, AKA, AKA the Pupa. AKA the Pupa. AKA, 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 AKA the Pupa. AKA, 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 AKA the <clears throat> Anyway, where were we? Oh right, winter. Montana was about as cold as you might expect December in Montana to be. So after making the necessary arrangements to legalize our new residency, we did what anyone with a desire to keep all 20 fingers and toes would do and fled to the desert. We had no real plan, and didn't plan on getting one. The only goal was to keep driving south until things felt comfortable. And besides, we'd never seen the Southwest, so we figured just about anywhere would be a good place to start. 
That anywhere turned out to be the outskirts of Tucson, Arizona. where we'd spend the next month or two doing what most desert dwellers do, soaking up the sun and relishing the solitude. We'd spent years preparing ourselves for life on the road, and at long last, this was the reward. To be present and content and no longer bound by obligation or the clock. And on our doorstep was an environment so beautifully diverse and alien that the thought of what's next hadn't even crossed our minds. We were there, and that was enough. Arguably the biggest misconception about the desert is that it's, well, a desert. An empty expanse, devoid of life, variation, or intrigue. But anyone who spends even a few hours quietly walking its sandy washes, jagged slopes, or prickly barrens, knows that the desert is rich with life. Life that's flourished in the extremes and that ebbs and flows with the seasons. And though it's tremendously unlikely that a place best known for its lack of water would have evolved its very own species of native trout, there are, in fact, salmonids to be found in the southwest. But we'll get to them a little later down the line. For now, trout were the farthest things from our minds. Besides, it was the dead of winter, and our quarry were enjoying the long rest beneath a deep blanket of snow and ice. Got ya. The majority of our lives have been spent in and around the deciduous and boreal forests of the north, but we now found ourselves in an entirely new forest, one characterized by the region's most iconic figure, the mighty saguaro cactus. Whether you know it or not, You've seen these large, spiny, almost humanoid cacti used as a symbol of the Southwest, from Western films to children's cartoons to corporate advertising. Things what stick in your finger when you touch them. Maybe, maybe, right. Oh, golly, that's not a bad looking little cactus. They symbolize the romance of a wild and ancient landscape that many are inspired by, but few have actually explored. The truth is that these magnificent giants aren't just reminders of the once wild west, they're survivors of it. Most saguaros will achieve the ripe old age of 150 to 200 years old, and by the time they've reached a height of six feet or sprouted their first arm, they've likely already lived 80.
When most of the cacti we were now living amongst were seedlings, Arizona was a very different place. In fact, for some of the oldest saguaros, it wasn't even Arizona yet. The Sonoran Desert, an ecosystem extending from northern Mexico to southern Arizona and California, is the only place on Earth that produces saguaros, and for thousands of years, it saw very little excitement. The native people of the region lived in close harmony with the saguaro, using its fruit for food and drink, and its body and skeletal ribs for tools, containers, furniture, and other utilities. The Tohono O'odham, Pima, and Siri people still practice these traditional techniques today, used not only by the native peoples, but also a plethora of native birds, rodents, reptiles, and insects. The saguaro is a true keystone species and the heart of this iconic landscape. But, like all of the American West, the Sonoran Desert isn't as wild as it once was, and the sprawl of its urban centers has eaten up large swaths of the saguaro forest and continues to do so on a yearly basis. In the mid-90s, action was taken to protect what was left of the unique ecosystem outside of Tucson, with the official designation of Saguaro National Park. But unfortunately, the two islands of wilderness flanking the east and west of town are growing increasingly isolated as the city has ballooned by more than 2,500% in the last 60 years alone. The growth is projected to continue, and 60 years from now, the park will be entirely surrounded by suburban development. Isolated, protected patches of wilderness were once believed to be enough to maintain healthy and wild ecosystems. But as the American population continues to grow, we've learned that wide-ranging and interconnected habitat is essential to the survival of our native flora and fauna. What will the future hold for the Sonora and its iconic cacti? It's impossible to know, but it's guaranteed to be different. We relished the time we had in Tucson, because we knew that with each subsequent return, we'd be greeted by a little less of the wild and a little more of the domestic. So are you ready to leave? Yes and no. I'm ready to leave because I'm ready to see some new stuff, but also I'm like afraid to leave because I'm gonna miss it. Yeah. It's been so nice to be here. All good things must come to an end. And before we knew it, we were ready to hit the road again. We decided to push north to California to scratch an itch we'd had since childhood. We were en route to the hottest place on earth. But first, we made a pit stop in another unique and beautiful Mojave ecosystem, Joshua Tree National Park. This incredible high desert plateau, aptly named for its abundance of Joshua trees, a species of giant yucca, encompasses an area the size of Rhode Island. The trees are magical and whimsical, and though our inner naturalists were distracted by thoughts of giant ice age sloths gorging on their fruit, Our inner children were lost in what felt like a distinctly Dr. Seussian landscape. Despite surviving for over two and a half million years, the trajectory of current climate trends spell certain disaster for these endearing desert dwellers. And scientists now believe that by the end of the century, only two tenths of one percent of the Joshua Tree's currently suitable habitat within the park will remain, 
and with it will go a complex and rich ecosystem. Increased and prolonged drought facilitate poor conditions for seedling recruitment, and the spread of invasive grasses have left the otherwise fire-resistant forest at major risk for burns. It's often hard, amidst the overwhelming number of stories of climate anxiety and environmental despair, to try and find the silver lining. But at our best, human beings are creatures of hope. And there is still some hope, however slim, for the Joshua Tree. A petition was recently accepted by California's Fish and Game Commission to list the Joshua Tree as endangered, allocating important resources and protections to help maintain its survival long term. The reality, however, is that regardless of the increased effort to save them, 80% of the world's Joshua trees will be gone by century's end. We didn't know it yet, but we'd find ourselves returning to the park and the Mojave at large many more times in the months ahead. But for now, we were just passing through. A couple of weeks ago, we blew a bypass cap in our coolant lines outside of Tucson on a really hot day, and we dumped a bunch of gallons of coolant out before we realized what was happening. Um, we were able to stop the leak and get that plugged up and get on our way, but we introduced a bunch of air into the system, and these vans have a labyrinthian system of hoses that's highly pressurized and doesn't self-bleed, so um, you're required to figure out how to purge the air, and radiators in the front, motors in the back. Uh, the hoses go up and down with different high and low points, the air gets trapped and replaced. Um, since that happened though, our van's been running hotter than we'd like it to. One of the causes of that would be that there's still a lot of air in the system and we've been bleeding it slowly out of the front. We have another heater under here on the bench which is not as convenient to get to, so we've put it off up until now. Oh. Oh boy. We're hoping that that will solve our issues. Oh, my eyes are watering. The thing is, it doesn't look that windy out there. Well, it is. <laughs> it's pretty windy! It wasn't the first time we'd been to Death Valley. But it was definitely Bullwinkles. Claiming the lowest point in the country at 283 feet below sea level and surrounded by towering peaks reaching upwards of 11,000 feet, 
Death Valley's entry and exit points are, how should I put this, challenging for our little four-cylinder Wasser Boxer. Combine that with a healthy dose of limited amenities and just a dash of the hottest ambient air and ground temperatures ever recorded on planet Earth, and we're starting to paint a picture of why this national park can be less than hospitable to vintage Volkswagen vans. Undeterred, we coasted our way down into the largest tract of protected wilderness in the lower 48. Whether or not we'd make it back out again was anyone's guess. Despite having more than 3 million acres of designated wilderness, there are thousands of miles of roads crisscrossing the valley, though the majority of them sport signs that strongly discourage the use of two-wheel drive vehicles. But for every naysayer with a souped-up overland rig, there's an overconfident and perhaps naive Vanagon owner reminding them that these old machines are surprisingly capable off-road. So with the courage that only a couple who'd never actually taken their van down a Jeep road before could muster, we set off to see something we'd been dreaming of for decades, the famed racetrack. On the next episode of For Wild Sake.